episode 300 of the Horror Guys. Yay! This is the one where we do our show live. No, we always do our shows live. Well, we record them live. Okay, we're then they're then they're recorded. (laughs) Okay, this is a podcast. It's not live. We have an audience. The she's, cat is she's asleep, asleep right here. On, yes. She's asleep on the footstool. Yeah, you may hear some meows or whimpers once in a while, but that's that's the extent of our live audience. The cat is our number one fan. Yeah, she is. Well, okay, three hundred episodes in of the Horror, Horror Weekly. Guys. Depends on who you ask. Horror <laughs> Weekly. Yes, I'm Kevin. I'm Brian. Did we get cake? No. Giant frosted cookie? No. Okay. All right. Might splurge for pizza later or something. Who knows? Yeah. Who yeah. knows? Yeah. All right, so when we first decided to do a podcast, we didn't decide to do Horror Guys first. It was an Alfred Hitchcock kind of podcast. We were going to do Alfred Hitchcock movies, one a week. But then we realized... Then we figured out he only made like 54 movies and it would end. Yeah, one a week wasn't very much, and and wait, that's that's finite. Yeah, then what? Then what? Well, I thought we'd be done with horror movies by now. I mean, come (laughs) on. They keep making more. They do. How yeah. do you? How do you? How do they expect us to ever catch up? So Alfred Hitchcock <laughs> didn't make enough movies, so we decided to just go with horror in general. Well, plus there was so many good horror movies that we wanted to see and talk about too. Yeah, and Alfred Hitchcock was just too limited. A lot of his stuff isn't really horror. No, it brushes the genre, but it's it's definitely more mystery and thriller than than horror and just plain romances yeah. and dramas too yeah he's known for suspense but he did other things yeah so here we are 300 1700 later. films later <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they just keep making more keep of them making more <laughs> make them stop yeah I, i'm getting ready to put out the uh horror monthly issue 37 in a few days hot diggity all the movies every single one of them except for one was 2024 there's so many new movies. They keep cranking them out. And the only reason that one wasn't there is because we wanted to do completionism on The Strangers. We had to watch one old one. And, uh, I mean, it, it, you know, as evidence this week, we've got several indies. Yeah. Um, over the years, it's gotten easier for people to make indies. Yes. The technology's gotten better where people can easily access. And, um, yeah, so in addition to the mainstream horror that's coming out steadily a lot more indies i don't know that it's necessarily all that well it is easier for indie people to make horror films but it's it's so much easier to distribute them now there's so many places that take indie films yeah and and so many places online that uh yeah i I guess that's more of a more of a thing but the technology is there too to make things easier yeah i mean 20 years ago we could have made a horror movie but who would have seen it nobody would have ever seen it yeah now you can put it on YouTube, even if you know, you know, or or Vimeo, or you know, you can, you can publish it yourself. I think Tubi takes just about anything. <laughs> well, some 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 of that stuff on there, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. So we have done over seventeen hundred movie short and long movie reviews at this point, and if you add in the ones from the books that aren't actually published on the site anywhere, it's almost two thousand. We're getting close. Yeah. So. Are we all out of horror movies? No. There's lots of horror movies. But you know what? We like movies that aren't horror, too. We do. No, we've watched all those Hammer movies and Universal movies way back in the beginning, and we like the old movies. Frankenstein, Dracula, The Wolfman, and other, other classic movies that aren't horror are kind of cool, too, sometimes. So then we got to thinking, what if we were to talk about other classic movies? Yeah. Classics Weekly. Classics Weekly? That sounds like Horror Weekly, only with classic movies. <laughs> <laughs> we are also the Classics Guys. <laughs> Brand new episode one coming up next Wednesday. We're going to talk about Casablanca. Yeah. If you go over to ClassicsWeekly.com, you'll see a very blank looking website. It's a, a Substack website, just like Horror Weekly is. But you can sign up for the newsletter and podcast there. Just like you do with the one you're listening to right now. And next Wednesday, and every Wednesday thereafter, you'll get a new classic movie. And we're going to, it's going to be more of a focus on one movie. At least one for, movie at, at least time, for now. yes. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. But uh, yeah, starting with uh, one movie a little more in depth. Could you imagine if we did five or six horror movies and five or six classic movies every week? How I'd... little time we'd have for eating. 
<laughs> We'd have to eat in front of the television. <laughs> yeah. We're always watching. <laughs> we do that half the time anyway. Well, that's true. So yeah, brand new podcast, classicsweekly.com. And it'll have a weekly newsletter and a weekly podcast, just like the one you're listening to or just like the one you read. And yeah, just one movie at a time. But since it's only one movie, we can go into a lot more detail on the trivia and the opinions. And it's pretty cool. We've already got a couple of them recorded and I think it's looking very promising. Yeah. But this time around. Horror movies. Horror movies. Got a slight little focus, sort of an accidental focus on home invasions. It does lean that way this week, yeah. We were going to do the Strangers Chapter 1, and before that we had to finish off with the, the Strangers Pray at Night, because we hadn't seen that one yet. Right. So that's all three of the existing Strangers movies we've done. Mm-hmm. And then we got Sunset Superman, just coincidentally this week, which oh. is also about a home invasion. Also known as Don't Mess With Grandma. Yeah. It's got a dual title there. All right, then we got a couple of them that have nothing to do with home invasions. we got Livia's House, A Tale of Romance and Gaslighting, as well as Mother Nocturna, a new indie release about mental illness, depression, and family. Mm-hmm. And a couple of short films, too, because we like short films. Because we do like short films, and lo- those are so many frees on uh, YouTube with, yeah. the, with the shorts. Yeah, yeah, we like those short films Yeah, because they're short, Yeah, and they're uh-huh. films, and yeah. they're horror, and... Why not? Yeah, why not? You got three minutes? Watch our short horror film. Why not, indeed. All right. Well, let's start off this time with Livia's House from 2024. Okay. Directed by Nico Balenkis, written by Patricia V. Davis. Stars Tara Nicole Caldwell, Joshua Malakos, and Danielle Octavian. Hour and 56 minutes. Kind of on the long side. That is a little long, isn't it? But we didn't feel it was very long. It, it kept us kept us engrossed. Yeah. Okay, tell us what the spoiler-free judgment is about. Well, this one is actually heavy on the mystery and thriller aspects. And kind of low-key low key on horror. Uh, the cinematography, cast, direction, story, all keep a long movie interesting. I thought they did a nice job with it. Um, doesn't seem long. Does take quite a while to start wrapping things up, though, and telling us what's going on and why. We liked it quite a bit, though, and we'd recommend it. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. All right, well, this is a brand new movie. You probably haven't seen it yet, so we're not going to spoil it, but uh, just give, give them, you a little taste give here. Give a little taste. We open on farmers working in an orchard. Ed then takes a break and buries a man alive in the field. You know, as one does. Wait, wait, what? <laughs> he buried his guy in the field. Well, there's some of the horror aspects of it. Credits roll. Well, we cut to karaoke night at the bar, and Tara and Helen laugh at Johnny, who's singing. It's karaoke. You know it's terrible. Yeah, he's not great. Tara's mother is not a fan of Johnny, who is making Tara move from the city way out into the country. They stop at a house and meet a really weird guy named Georgie there. Yeah, mom's not happy. Her baby's moving away. Eventually, they get to their own house, and it's a big one. It's not a little place. It's a nice house. Johnny says they have a landline phone, but no Wi-Fi, but she needs that for work. There's a painting on the wall of Livia, a famous Italian painter who used to live there. Hey, this must be Livia's house. It's Livia's house, yeah. Livia got called back to Italy and had to sell the house cheap, and Johnny just got lucky. That night, as they sleep, a rat climbs up on the bed and licks Tara on the face. Ew. Yuck. She screams. Johnny searches, but there are no rats to be found in the house. Hmm, did she imagine it? A week passes, and Tara's mom complains that she's hard to reach by cell phone. We get the impression mom might be just a little bit crazy there. Yeah, Uh uh-huh. We flash back to Tara finding a photo of her mother with a man she doesn't recognize when mom freaks out. Well, Tara goes for a walk and bumps into a strangely silent man who warns her about coyotes. Harbinger. Could be. Sort of. Later, we see that man flying a small airplane over the countryside. Well, Tara goes to the post office to send a fax. And Marianne, the woman who runs the place, tells her how to get internet access. She tells them about Dale, a local guy who can fix them up. The bar also has Wi-Fi. Georgie is there, too, and he's still weird. Yeah, he, he sings is. to them. He's, a, he's an odd character. Johnny is weirdly protective, but maybe in a creepy way. All right, so things are getting weird. 
there's no Wi-Fi, which is plenty weird by itself. And she's a little isolated. A little bit, yeah. Okay, so we'll stop there because, yeah, it's a good stopping place. Well, it's very colorful, sharp, and very visual, with many artistic shots of the country and various settings. It's not boring at all, but it does take quite a while to get to the main plot. One thing is, I don't understand is why Tara didn't just go back to the city right away. She's way too tolerant. Yeah, I... She I, puts I, up with a lot. There, there's things we can't say without spoiling it, but she puts up with yeah, way too much. Yeah, logically, at, at a couple points, I was thinking, this would be a good place to leave. But, yeah, she sticks it out. Yeah, yeah. okay. There's not a whole lot I can say here without spoiling it, because it's kind of a mystery. Mystery develops. Yeah. Things, yeah. things happen, and it's, it's good. Yeah, in my commentary, that's the only real criticism I have about it, too, is her Why didn't staying she just get around out? too long. Uh-huh. She, she's starting to figure out things seem wrong, and, yeah, she's got the means to leave, and there's a you know the best friend and her mother that she could stay with, and, yeah, which she chooses to stay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, let's move on, then, to Mother Nocturna, a.k.a. Madre Noturna. Written and directed by Danielle Campea, stars Susanna Castaglione, Sofia Ponente, and Eduardo Oliva. If that sounds Italian to you, there's it a is. reason for that. Yes, it's, it's in Italian with subtitles. Hour and 40 minutes, trailer in the show notes. Spoiler free! It starts out slow, quiet, and gloomy. And then it gets more slow, quiet, and gloomy. The acting and production values are all very good, although they're kind of slow, quiet, and gloomy. <laughs> yeah, you're seeing a trend there. Yeah. It, the script doesn't go anywhere. It wallows in misery. There are some horror elements that give it some interesting moments that I don't think either of us cared too much for it when it was done. It's just a sad movie. So many movies lately <laughs> are, you know, the horror of depression. Uh-huh. And the certainly is. there is. monsters? No. It's mostly just depression. <laughs> yeah. And, um, the real monster is the depression we had all along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's slow and quiet and gloomy. Well, what happens? And it, this actually takes place at the beginning of COVID. Is yes. A, is an yeah. element to it, too, where, sh- where lockdown is starting and uh, people are starting to get, you know, some people starting to get severely sick from it for the first time. And, Other than getting the uh, husband out of the picture, though, it was uh, a COVID. Plot, it was a plot device. Yeah, yeah, it seems like they were isolated enough out in the country that COVID didn't really matter. Yeah, they were. They wouldn't already, have seen anybody anyhow. They were kind of already on lockdown. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, give us a taste. Well, a woman dances as the credits roll. We cut to a hospital where Agnes is getting released after 13 years. What kind of injury do you stay in the hospital 13 years for? The mental kind. Oh, yes. Yeah. Her husband, Ricardo, talks to the doctor, and he says Agnes is recovering, and he's optimistic after 13 years of treatment. But they don't know what the problem is. And the conversation shifts to Ricardo's daughter, Ariana, who is graduating this year. But they do know what the problem is. We, we find out very quickly that their daughter died. That, uh, 10 or 13 years ago, and she's been depressed ever since. Mm-hmm. This is not a mystery. No. Why yeah. does the doctor say he doesn't know what's wrong? He's a very bad doctor, apparently. Well, but she's so bad about it. I mean, she, you know, it's it's normal to, you know, you lose a child, you mourn. Some people get over it and move on. Some people and don't. she never, yeah, she's, she's never able to deal with it and, and move on and get back to her life. Okay. And back to normal, which... He, he finds a mystery, I think, is, is the point that he was trying to make. Yeah. Okay, he, go on. He doesn't understand why she is still, you know, 13 years later. No. Well, they all go home together. Agnes asks Ariana if she still dances. Agnes is a wolf biologist, and she gets right back into it, I notice, after 13 years. They live way out in the woods, yeah. and there's wolves nearby. Yeah. The mother and daughter go out into the woods and look at wolf tracks, and... They set up some t- trail cameras to watch the wolves. At school, Mateo asks Ariana out on a date, and she avoids answering him. And he's kind of a bully about it. He's, he's intimidating. Well, after a while, Ricardo has to leave to make a house call. He's a doctor. He has to go. So leaves the mother-daughter there. Agnes spends her day looking at old bones in the field before watching videos of the wolves. A lone wolf comes to her door, and she smiles, but then it's gone. 
Ricardo is surprised uh, to talk to her about that, uh, to hear about that, because um, they haven't had any wolves around in ages. And here's where you're wondering, is she hallucinating any wolves? Well, she's clearly suffering from depression, and he knows it and tries to cheer her up. We hear about COVID lockdowns in the news. Lockdowns are getting started. At dinner, Agnes sees something in the room with them that terrifies her. Ariana's not even sure she's happy that her mother is at home. Are you sure it won't happen again? And you wonder what the it is. Well, that night, Agnes wakes up and talks to the darkness until Ricardo sends her back to bed. In the morning, she notices that her feet are dirty, like she sleptwalked outdoors. Well, Ricardo goes to work again, leaving Ariana alone with Agnes again, who talks about her favorite depressing opera. Ariana gets a phone call. Ricardo has tested positive for COVID, can't come home. By morning, they hear that he's been intubated, and he's not doing well. All right, so they got the mother and the daughter out in the woods in a cabin, isolated and locked down, no help, no assistance from outside, and the woman is maybe a little on the crazy side. Uh Uh-huh. Sounds like a recipe for disaster. Yeah, it does. All right, we'll stop talking there because you don't want to spoil it. But for a while, early on, it gave off hints that it was going to be a werewolf movie. Well, I wish that had been the case. We wish we were that lucky. (laughs) Yeah. It's extremely slow, atmospheric, and moody. For the first hour, the only real action is occasional shots of Ariana dancing. And those really don't have any relevance to the plot. I think they just thought maybe you need to liven this up because it's kind of boring. And, and, and as far as her dancing, I really wasn't that. I mean, she she gyrates in her underwear to, to music. It it's wasn't, something to keep the film from being too depressing and boring, I think. Yeah, yeah. But her, her, I wasn't impressed with her dancing. I guess that's dancing. Yeah. It's like mm. rubber, you know, um, boneless chickens, that that joke, where they flop around on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Well, it, it, reminds me, it reminded me of some of Madonna's early work, dancing. And, and she even made a joke about it later uh, when she was thanking her fans in a... In a message and she said you you even loved me even when i thought that rolling on my floor in the underwear was da- rolling on the floor in my underwear was dancing <laughs> okay she dances as good as madonna then and that's what it made me think of she just rolling on the floor in her underwear and calling it dancing <laughs> all right <laughs> you know. well we're just past the one hour point before we get any hint that this might have some horror elements to it it's dark and depressing it's well shot and looks good throughout It is very good at showing the stress of dealing with someone who has mental illness and family tragedy, but there's very little actual story here. Even the reveal at the end, that kind of explains some things, wasn't particularly surprising or impactful. I get the feeling this end was supposed to be a twist that's going to be like, that's what it's all about. I I didn't gasp. I didn't care. I didn't gasp. It didn't make much difference. Yeah, it didn't, no. No, yeah. And, you know, it was all just stuff that happened in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it had some moments that I enjoyed. The wrap-up was a little interesting, but, you know, just mostly a depressing slog. Yeah, didn't care for it. I hate to pick on the indie movies, but, but can't yeah, this, this one, one was films. not for us. Now then, my favorite of the week, mm-hmm. Don't Mess With Grandma. That's my favorite of the week, too. Also known as Sunset Superman, and it's also the least horror movie of the bunch. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. Written and directed by Jason Krozik. Stars Michael Jai White, Jai or Jay? Or I, I always thought it was Jay. Michael J. White, Jack Spawn. Yeah, uh-huh. you know he did that like thirty years ago, and, and he still, still doesn't look that. all that old. Yeah, he's he's aged gracefully. Jackie yeah. Richardson, Richardson, and Billy Zane. All right, and Billy Zane is almost unrecognizable. He kept giving me like Walter White <laughs> vibes, yeah, but the comedic version. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Spoiler free. Spoiler free? I, uh-huh. I will spoiler free it. Uh, this was awesome fun. There is a hint of horror element to home invasion and being cut off without the ability to call for help. But this is really more humor and action than anything else. We really enjoyed it. Yeah, they took a, a very common horror trope, like The Strangers, for example. Yeah. And just totally threw out the scary and made it just silly. Just silly. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. 
and again, my favorite of the week. Mm-hmm. Me too. Uh, going through the Horror Monthly for it, this issue, I think this may have been my favorite movie of the month. It was way up there. Yeah. Well, JT, we learn later his name is Jasper something, I don't remember, delivers food to an old man with a goose that hates him. Well, the goose does, not the old man. Right. We get flashes of how our, how hard his job can be sometimes. It's a sort of Meals on Wheels organization, and we see that maybe he's not real good at it. He tries. Or maybe it's just that hard and he is that good at it. <laughs> his co-worker, Trent, asks if he's talked to his grandma about a nursing home. Turns out he lives two hours away from her, and he visits every day. That's a long drive. That's a lot of commuting. Credits roll as JT makes the long drive to Grandma's house, listening to awful audiobooks. And we get to hear some of this audiobook as he's driving, and it's pretty terrible. It's pretty bad, yeah. Grandma's dog hate J- hates JT, just like the goose does. Maybe it's him. Well, the bossy old lady has JT carry a bear's head and hide it upstairs. A hide. Bear, bear's head and hide. Oh, yeah. Not not hide it. It's, <laughs> it's not just the head. It's the whole. It's a whole pelt. Well, they're having some chicken corn chowder for dinner, but there's no chicken or corn. So, yeah, I don't know what that it's, is. It's just chowder. <laughs> Grandma's house is full of taxidermied animals. Some work done by the now passed on Grandpa. Well, Grandma's sink upstairs is broken. JT gets to work on fixing it. It's either that or reading erotic novels to Grandma. That's kind of a funny scene. He starts, I'll just read you a book. And he pulls one up and... It doesn't go very far. <laughs> yeah, that's enough of that. <laughs> While he's upstairs working, several men wearing pig masks and carrying knives break in the window. As one of the men approaches Grandma, JT beats him silly. The other man tries to jab t- stab JT, but stabs her accomplice accidentally. These are not very coordinated people. They're not competent home invaders, no. When the stabbed man starts to cry and scream, JT orders him to shut up before Grandma finds out. Then he literally throws him out the window onto the porch as the guard dog sleeps in the corner. Yeah, it's a great guard dog. And I think we'll stop there. <laughs> the whole movie is about these home invasions, and he's trying to keep keep them out before Grandma hears about it. She's deaf, so they can get away with that, a lot. That helps, yeah. And he takes but her, he doesn't want her to know. He takes her hearing aid away at one point <laughs> to, to help And then him. he gets annoyed because she can't hear him. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, he's trying to keep it from her. So it's it, there's a lot of damage control and... Yeah, and these these doofs of home invaders just will not give up, and he won't give up, of course. And yeah, it's it's quite a war going on. <laughs> yeah. Well, this film involves a very serious, terrifying home invasion. No, not no, so, not, so not so much. No. <laughs> oh, the writer said he wrote this specifically to see Michael J. White punch as many people as possible in eighty minutes. And that's true. Or was it eighty seconds? <laughs> eighty minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he punches a bunch of people. Yeah, he does. Well, character JT laughs and wisecracks throughout the film. He never gets angry and sees the whole situation as amusing for the most part. His attitude and self-narration throughout is probably the best thing here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's perfect for the role. He's not exactly having a good time, but it's like, yep, it's Tuesday, home he's, invasion time. <laughs> he's got a good attitude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I liked everything about it. This one's yeah. definitely a winner. Yeah, I, I, I like the, well, it, it's, I'm not sure it's on, it's on Tubi, I believe, but I don't remember which name it's using. I think Sunset Superman, because the the director and the writer said he didn't like that title so much. But I think it is under Tubi, yeah. So, yeah. Well, I think Don't no. Mess With Grandma sounds a whole lot better. Oh, well, no, I remember seeing Don't Mess With Grandma on the screen, on the search screen. It's one of those, folks. <laughs> you know, if you don't find it under one, find it under the other. Justwatch.com says yep. nothing, because the site won't load. Okay. There it goes. Okay. High tech. Don't mess he's, with the Zohan. No, that's not it. He's uh, 56 now. And in very good shape. Huh. Michael, okay. Michael J. White. Sunset Superman is on well, Apple TV Plus right now. It could be one of those things that uh, isn't quite out yet. But we don't have an embargo on. So there you go. Watch for it. It'll be out there under one of those names. Yeah, well. <laughs> wow, we are professional today, aren't we? We are. 300 episodes you think we'd know what we're talking about soon. And Billy Zane is 57. Hmm. 
Okay, I kind of assumed he'd be was older than that by now. Yeah. He's been bald for 40 years. Yeah, he went bald early. The Strangers, Pray at Night, 2018. The second movie in the series. All right. Well, we liked the first one okay. It was it was creepy and scary and... It was all right. Home Invasion. I didn't love it. I think but it was this okay. one was better. I thought so, too. Directed by Johannes Roberts. Written by Brian Bertino and Ben Katai. Stars Christina Hendricks from Mad Men, Martin Anderson, and Bailey Madison. Hour and 25 minutes, trailer in the show notes. So it's short and gets right to it. Yeah. I thought this was like the, you know, the first one, only more so. I liked it. All three of the Strangers movies so far have been pretty much the same. You know, the three people come to the house, they have their same method of operation, and they based, do their thing. Yeah, Based on true events. Yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah, I don't know about that neither. Well, no. it took the elements of the first movie and dialed it up a bit in this one. It's more of the same, but more so in victims, action, and violence. We both thought they improved on it with this one, and it's a worthy sequel that we would recommend. Yeah, if you like the first one, you should check, check out check out this one. Not usually a fan of home invasion type movies, but this was certainly better than the first. The first one was good, but this one was better. Yeah, it was. And then we'll talk about chapter one here in a minute, but uh, tell us what this one's about. Well, we open on an old pickup truck with three people inside. They pull up off the side of the road, a foggy road near a house. An old woman wakes up. There's a knock at her door. Well, turns out the knock is coming from inside the house. Someone in a doll mask lays down in bed next to the old woman's sleeping husband. And credits roll. They've been invaded already. And then we cut to Mike, Cindy, and their daughter Kinsey, who are packing for a trip. They pick up their son Luke on the way to Uncle Marv and Aunt Cheryl's place. Kinsey is going to a boarding school that her, hus- uh, her her parents really can't afford. Kinsey has done some bad stuff this year, and she's going to be sent away to straighten up. We never do really find out what she did. No, we don't, yeah. Well, they arrive at Marv and Shirley's place, Cheryl's place. It's the uh, place that we saw before the credits. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. They have their own mobile home. So Cheryl's, uh, Merv and Cheryl's place was like the headquarters where they live, and it's a mobile home park. But soon, there's a knock at the door at their mobile home. A girl is there, wanting to talk to Tamara. Well, the Tamara woman comes back later and asks again. She's still not here. Yeah. She leaves, and then Kinsey and Luke talk about their futures. They walk to another mobile home that has its door left open. They walk right in and help themselves to the booze in the cupboard. And then they hear a noise from the back and find the dog trapped in the bedroom. There's also the smell of death and a crazy wall of hellos written all over the place. And then they find the body. Sounds like the stopping point. So yeah, remember the uh, first one, there was the rich couple in their big fancy house. They ran from room to room hiding cat and mouse. Well, this one's in a mobile home. So there's not a lot of rooms to run around in. But it's a mobile home park. They go over the park instead, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, off-season, so they're the only ones there. And Uncle Marv and Aunt Cheryl have already bought the farm. We saw that before the credits. They make a mention early on that it's off-season, and what do they do up here when everybody else is gone, which explains why the whole mobile home park is, you know, not full of people. Why do they not run to a neighbor's house? But because they don't the explain that. Na- I think the few neighbors that were there are dead. I think, Maybe. I th- you know, they found this one body. I think the implication is there could be other ones there, too. They, yeah. they swept through and killed everybody that had, you know, that was lingering. Could it was be. probably mostly empty. Yeah, it's supposed you know. to be the off season, but there's cars and lights on in most of those houses. I think it's because they killed them all. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. Well, Kevin noted immediately that the actor who plays teenage Luke is Bill Pullman's son. I noted that it's a normal-looking mobile home park full of occupied houses with lights on. And Kevin pointed out later why that might be. I think that's my theory. Yeah. 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 All right. Yes. Okay. It was explained that it was the off-season. All right. Well, the small mobile homes don't allow for the hide-and-seek antics of the first film, so they had to do something else here. The whole park. Yeah. It was basically the same plot as the first one, only they went to some new places with this one and actually improved on it, in my opinion. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. 
Oh, and that, that man in the bag mask has very good taste in 80s music. You yeah, know? he does. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And he doesn't, if you look at the IMDb credits, he's just man in mask. <laughs> he never has a name. <laughs> oh, in the, in the third movie, they call him Scarecrow. Okay. The yeah. the two women are pin, pin up and doll face. Doll face. And that's yeah. consistent throughout all the movies. But the man, just man in mask. But later he's Scarecrow. Oh, come on. Yeah, Scarecrow yeah. makes more sense. Yeah. Well, at least the daughter is really a teenager. Okay. <laughs> you don't like the 30-year-old teenagers. Oh, yeah. I mean, teenage Luke, he was he was good. Bill Pullman's son, he was good. But, but he's like 30, isn't he? Oh, he's not a teenager. No. Yeah. 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 I know Big, that's one of your hot buttons. Yeah. Bigger playground for the cat and mouse. More violence, more action. So, Which I, do you hate worse? Hmm? 30-year-olds playing teenagers or cartoons? Oh, boy. <laughs> it depends on the cartoon. There's some cartoons I like. <coughs> some. 2024's <laughs> The Strangers, Chapter 1. Directed by Rennie Harlan, written by Alan R. Cohen, Alan Friedland, and Brian Bertino. Stars Madeline Pesch, Freud Gutierrez, and Richard Brake. Hour and 31 minutes. And this is the first of a trilogy. Which a, I did not know that going into this. It's sort of a re- reboot. A soft reboot. Yeah. Yeah. I like Richard Brake here getting third billing. You know who he was? Who? He was the sheriff who was sitting at a table in a diner. Third billing. I don't think he even spoke. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, I assume he'll be back in the in the sequels. Okay. But yeah, the sheriff did nothing. He's literally <laughs> nothing here. Well, spoiler free, this was well made. It was good effects, believable acting, and lots of suspense. But it wasn't much of anything new that we haven't seen before. There were way too many similarities to the first two films in the series. By the third film, it's like, well, we've already seen this before. Give us something new. But on the other hand, there is so much you can do with an idea like this. If you like the previous movies, you'll probably like this one, but don't expect a whole lot of surprises. And um, if you haven't seen the previous films, you'd also be okay just starting with this one, probably. It's not vital that you see the first and it's kind of the start of a new trilogy, which I guess there's going to be more story and twists and plots and things, you know, that'll happen in the next two. But for the for now, this was just kind of, you know, it was good, but it was just kind of more of the same. Well, we got some side characters this time that didn't die. We got the sheriff. We got that waitress who drives him to the place. Uh-huh. I suspect most of and these characters that we've kind of seen are going to turn out to be the bad guys later on. Well, they're going to continue on in the other movies. There's yeah. going to be, yeah. And a survivor girl. And yeah, not, not everybody dies here. Yeah, yeah. Well, a man runs through the woods in terror. The strangers approach him, and the baghead man, who is now Scarecrow, Scarecrow yeah. hacks him with his axe. We're told that 1.4 million people go missing every year. Seven just since the film started. Yeah. Okay, so these guys are busy, I guess. Somewhere in Oregon, it's Ryan and Maya's fifth anniversary of dating. They complain about having no phone signal here in the middle of nowhere. They stop at a diner and everyone stares at them. What kind of place do you go in? Two people stop in off the road at a diner and the whole place stops to look. I don't know. I've never had that happen. They're not weird looking people. They don't have anything funny going. They're just, you know, a young couple and strangers, strangers, strangers in town. Eden and Neil are friendly, but most of the others aren't. They see a missing poster for Jeff Morrell, the guy who we saw killed in the pre credit sequence. When they leave, the alternator in their car is dead, so they have to order a part, and they have to spend the night. And he thinks it's a, a setup. <clears throat> Which it probably she, is. He's, he's suspicious of it, but she's more accepting of it. Waitress, waitress Shelley recommends an Airbnb locally. Ryan thinks mechanic Rudy is scamming them, but Maya is more trusting. They get to the Airbnb, and it's way nicer than any motel. That's a nice place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. Very nice. Just as the couple starts getting a little romantic, there's a knock at the door. Is Tamara here? Asks the shadowy girl. Someday there's going to be a Tamara at one of these houses, and it's just going to throw their whole thing off. <laughs> Ryan has left his inhaler in the car, which is way back in town, so he makes the trip on a motorcycle to go and retrieve it. Alone now... Maya here is knocking at the door, and again, is Tamara here? As she deals with the weirdo at the door, she loses her phone. Oopsie. Because somebody is in the house already. Yeah. In town, Ryan runs into Rudy, the mean mechanic, 
and gets what he comes for and goes to pick up some food. At the house, Baghead watches Maya take a shower, and he's not subtle about it. You know, if she'd open her eyes, she'd see him. Boy, she's oblivious there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, suddenly, the power goes out. When she gets out of the shower, there's a fire in the fireplace and other signs that she's not alone in the house. You know, fireplaces don't start themselves. No, no, they don't. Then she sees a woman in a doll mask and runs to hide. By the time Ryan returns, she's terrified. He thinks she's hallucinated the whole thing and runs off that Tamara girl outside yet again and they move on to eat their dinner. And that right there, like, oh yeah, she she's like, oh yeah, I must have been mistaken. There's just way too many things, like the fire in the fireplace and the, yeah. you know, there's, there's other stuff. Like, no, I really didn't imagine this, honey. <laughs> we need to leave now. <laughs> no, just sit down and have dinner. <laughs> well, then they find a dead bird hanging up in the kitchen and finally decide it's time to lock the doors. Now they decide to lock the doors. <laughs> oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> she thinks there was somebody in the house and didn't bother locking the doors. Yeah. All right, well, let's let it go there. If you've seen one of the Strangers movies, you know where this is going. They had, they get attacked and stuff. There's, yeah, they do. There's cat, yeah. And, there's cat and mouse and stuff. Well, it's the third film of the series and also the first of a new trilogy. All three new films, turns out, were filmed simultaneously. Since most of the baddies died in the previous film, oh, that kind of a spoiler, oh, spoiler there. spoiler. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this one is a prequel or maybe a requel to the first two films. Probably just got to consider those like side stories or something. Requel. Yeah. It has numerous similarities and repeated plot points to Pray at Night, but if it's been a few years since you saw that one, it might not be as noticeable. But we watched one one day before the other, so it was really obvious. Yeah, it was. They just did that in the previous movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that was six years ago. <laughs> Maybe you're not supposed to remember. Yeah. You're not supposed to binge them, I suppose. Yeah. Well, this has all the dumb tropes. Maya hearing things inside the house and knows there's someone outside, so she decides to take a shower. Of course. There's someone out there. They're knocking at the door. They're peeking in the windows. I'm going to get naked and take a shower. <laughs> Who does that? Who does that? <laughs> Ryan gets home, and she doesn't insist that she actually saw a doll face inside the house. And somebody stirred out a fire in the fireplace and other things. Yeah. <laughs> she smoked a little pot, so Ryan thinks she hallucinated. Boy, that's a trope. Then they have a peephole in the front door that they never use, not even once. People keep coming to the door, and they just open it open up. Open the door. <laughs> yeah, horror people are dumb. <laughs> it was awfully similar to the other two films, but if you like those, you'll probably like this as well. And you do not need to have seen the previous films to know what's happening here. Each one is kind of a standalone -y kind of thing. Anything to add? Uh, just, uh, no, just more of the same. You know, the face palm moments of, you know, well, suddenly it's time to lock the doors and windows. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I liked it okay. Just wasn't wasn't anything new enough. All righty. Well, there we have a couple of short films this week. The first one is 2024 called Zero Lux, the Hatman film. And, and I'm like, had, what the heck's a hat man? Is that the guy who did the film? And I had to look it up. We had to look that up. That's a, That's an urban legend kind of thing with a, a spiritual being that appears when people are close to death, or perhaps he is death himself. It's like Slender Man, one of those kind of modern urban myth kind of things. Uh -huh. Written and directed by Matt Sears, stars Sam Allen and Philip Ridout, six minutes, 52 seconds, and you can watch this one on YouTube. What happens? Well, a man's father has recently died. He comes into the old man's house to start going through his things and packing stuff up packing some photos, and he finds a bag containing a video camera in the closet. He turns on the camera, looks through it, nothing special. Well, then he turns on the zero lux mode, which is the night vision mode, and he does start seeing things through the camera that he's not meant to see. He's a magic camera. Yeah. Well, this one is based on the Hat Man, a ghost-like entity that many people have reported seeing. He's often reported as just standing in the corner of the room, just watching. Unless, of course, you have a special camera. And then you can see all kinds of things. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's got a full story, it's concise, and even without a lot of dialogue, it's clear what's going on. Yeah, this was an especially good one. Yeah. And then we go to our next one. Street number four from 2022, 
directed by Lark Lee, written by Lark Lee and Koji Steven Sakai, stars Tanya Hammerich, Susan Bush, and Elsa Luan. Seven minutes and seven and a half minutes. And there's a link, of course, to watch it on YouTube. Julia has recently moved into a new house with her husband, who is away, and she's pregnant. She loves the new house, but he doesn't, and they fight about it over the phone. She finds that her stove won't light, so she goes to the neighbor's house to borrow a lighter. The woman next door freaks out when Julia mentioned that she's moved in next door at number four. What could be so terrible about that house? We're going to find out. Yeah. It's well shot and looks good. We don't get a full explanation of why things are happening, but we never have any doubt about what is happening. Seems to be a ghost in the house, and it seems to be concerned with the baby. But why? You'll have to watch to find out. You never know with a ghost. Are they here to protect the baby, or are they here to eat the baby? Could go either <laughs> or way. Or possess the baby, or bring in the devil's father. Or what? I don't know. So babies bring in so many options. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> All the potential of a baby. <laughs> yeah. With b- barbecue sauce. Yeah. Well, that is our show for this week. Tune in next. Oh, and we forgot to mention, members only. The paid members got a special episode this week. Yeah. All five of the original Planet of the Apes films. Oh, yeah. Those were good. They were good. They were good in 70, 50 years ago, and they still are. Yeah, if you've, if you've only seen the modern ones, you really should check out the old ones, see what they were like, see where it what started with the practical effects. Practical faces, not CGI overlays of real actors. Yeah, most of those new ape movies I've seen once, and they all kind of blur together in my mind. Yeah, they do. But those old ones were very distinctive, and I... Yeah. I think they're more memorable. Well, I've probably seen them a well, dozen times. Well, probably because we saw yeah. them way back, too. Yeah. yeah, I find the older ones to be, story-wise, much better than the new ones. Yeah, I think so. But we'll probably be getting to the new ones pretty soon, because Kingdom has just come out, and we haven't reviewed it. We'll have to, we'll have to do all, all five of the new movies, or okay. six, or however many there were. Oh, team. But that is all for this week. Check out HorrorMonthly.com and pick up next month's issue. It will be out early next week early October, probably the first or second. Classics Weekly, our new podcast, will be out on Wednesday around, I think, 10 a.m. It's already set to launch. It is done and there. Nice. Ready to go on next week. Okay. Uh, Otherwise, we'll see you next week. See ya. See ya. See ya.